Welcome to Renegade Inc. The statistics are shocking. 55,000 mothers are pushed out of their jobs every year for being pregnant or needing maternity leave. 77% are actively discriminated against and almost half of all working mums say that they earn less now than they did before they had kids. So how do we end the motherhood penalty? Joining me to discuss the motherhood penalty is the founder of Pregnant Then Screwed, Jolie Brearley. Jolie, welcome. Um, Hi. It's always good to have a founder in who scratches their own itch, as we call it, because you founded Pregnant Then Screwed because uh, of something that happened to you within the workplace. Tell us about it. I was four months pregnant with my first child. I informed my employer that I was pregnant, yeah. and the next day they sacked me by voicemail. And my employer was a children's charity. It doesn't get better than that, does it? I mean, insofar as, my God, there's a massive problem on our hands here. I mean, that set of circumstances is quite special. Well, you would think it's very special, and I thought it was very unique, but actually it isn't. Not this wider malaise. Yes, exactly. There is this problem of women being pushed out of their jobs because they got pregnant. It's much wider than people realise. Did you feel incredibly isolated then when it happened to you? Do you think, oh, well, actually it's me? You know, did you start thinking, well, there's something wrong with me? And, you know, or did you quickly realise that there is a bigger problem? It took me a while to realise there was a bigger oh, so problem. So you, you thought it was you? you I thought... thought it was an isolated incident. I thought my employer was just particularly bad and hadn't really thought this through. And I thought, you know, the law will protect me. This is completely insane. And I had no idea how difficult it is to access justice and how common this, this problem is. And it wasn't until I had my son and started going to other baby groups and talking to other mums about what had happened that I realised that actually this is far more common than I realised. 54,000 women a year are pushed out of their jobs for daring to procreate. That's one in nine pregnant women will be forced out of their jobs. And 77% of working mums face some form of discrimination in the workplace. Did you think, uh, right, there's an injustice here when you started to realise it wasn't just you and it wasn't an isolated incident and actually there are tens of thousands of, of women annually that this happens to. Do you think, well, where's my recourse to legal compensation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I tried to do something about it and I then discovered I was having a high-risk pregnancy. The doctor told me that I could go into labour at any point uh, because of my problem. And had I gone into labour at that point, the baby would have died. So I couldn't, you know, I had to drop the case yep. because it was in, that was incredibly stressful. But I couldn't drop the case and then pick it up at a later date when I knew my baby was healthy because you have a three-month time limit to do something about it, which is a tiny amount of time. But it's also incredibly expensive. It costs, on average, £8,500 for a lawyer to support you to take a case to tribunal. That is a, a lot of money. And the average amount that you win at tribunal is about £8,500. So what's the point of taking it to tribunal? The irony is when you think about uh, this situation from an employer's point of view, the employer um, doesn't realise what women who've had a baby can bring to the workplace when they come back, you know, the set of skills that they can bring. Why are they so short-sighted and myopic? Why do they think, gosh, this is a cost centre, this isn't a value add? Well, we believe that it's expensive, that women going on maternity leave is expensive, and it's not. The government pays maternity leave, and some employers choose to enhance that pay, but they have no legal obligation to do that whatsoever. The reason why they would do that is because they want to attract more women into their business in the first place. We also, the research shows that the bias towards pregnant women is that they are of less value than other types of employees, mm. that they will be distracted and not committed to their jobs. So they just see the whole thing as just a bit of a problem. She's going to go off for nine months anyway. Filling that spot's going to be a nightmare. Let's just get rid of that problem mm. and carry on. And they're not looking at the long-term benefits, which are if you retain that skilled trained woman in the workplace, you're going to save thousands of pounds. But also maternity leave, taking time off is a great training ground. Mm. It's actually really brilliant for building skills. Mm. You learn about multitasking, you learn about patience. And there's loads of research that shows that when women have children, they're actually really productive. They're much more efficient yes. than before they had kids. Now, you can sit here and, and listen to that and think, well, why? 
Because surely a more enlightened organisation knows that culture is everything. The more diverse the culture, the better. And the better the culture, the more productivity. It's very mm -hmm. simple stuff, this. So why are employers resorting to a sort of default mechanism, which sort of belongs in the 1950s? Um, is it because their businesses are pushed? Is it because they're scared about, you know, keeping women on? Who are what, what is the thing that is driving these businesses to make these decisions? It's because because employers believe this narrative we, that they're we, told that women are who are pregnant are a burden to business, that they're going to be distracted, that they're not going to be as productive when they're at work. Just this whole narrative, and it's still people are still very comfortable to stand around the water cooler going, oh, she might get pregnancy, and so just watch her, or let's not employ that one. <laughs> childbearing age. No, childbearing age, exactly. A third of employees avoid hiring women of childbearing age because they think they're going to get pregnant on their watch and she's going to become a problem. And is this sort of enamelled with this idea that women want it all now? They want the career, they want the baby, they want the... Is, is that also prevalent in the thinking? I really hate the saying women want it all because mm. we don't say that about men. And, we, you know, we do know that women are more likely to ask for flexible working, for example, when they return. And employers are obsessed with presenteeism. They really believe that if you're sat at your desk for 10, 12 hours a day, that you are a better employee than somebody that comes in four days a week and is producing exactly the same amount of work. The, the person sat there 10 hours a day is messing about on Facebook for part so. of it, let's be honest. But, you so. know, and we're not looking at productivity, we're looking at presenteeism, who's warming that seat. And the stereotype works in the other way as well. So men who have children, they get pay rises and promotions. Right. Men with one child have a 5% pay rise compared to men without children. So the, these stereotypes are prevalent in every every form. Women have children, they get demoted, they get their pay decreased. Men have children, they get promoted and they get pay rises because we're still sort of in this 1950s mentality where we believe men are looking after the family and they need the money to take care of the wife and the children. And the woman really, she should be at home and she should be baking cakes and fluffing up cushions and doing the right thing by her kids. The irony with that uh, thinking is that I speak to a lot of um, friends and colleagues and you're only about five or six minutes away from uh, them telling you if you go out for a drink, actually, I'm finding it really difficult because I now uh, am a sole breadwinner and the job insecurity that comes with that is impacting my mental health. Yeah, men's mental health is drastically deteriorating because they are working these absolutely ridiculous hours in their job, they're not seeing their kids, their relationship with their wife is a mess, they're barely seeing each other, they're never seeing their friends, they're working themselves to the bone and they're unhappy as a result. Productivity increases with well-being, and we know that the fewer hours people work, actually the more productive they are. So if you look across the board at Europe, the fewer hours that that country works, the more productive that country is. There is a direct correlation between the two. And yet in the UK, we are the overtime, unpaid capital of Europe. We are working people to the bone and it makes absolutely no business sense and it makes absolutely no sense in terms of our mental health and well-being. The well-being in the UK is is really, really low. Let me suggest to you that um, Pregnant and Screwed isn't a, a women's issue organisation. Actually, it's a business organisation and it's a gender neutral organisation because what we're doing with this 1950s draconian thinking is putting enormous amounts of pressure on women, which in turn sets off a domino effect through uh, a marriage, through mm -hmm. a business, through a business culture, yeah. and ultimately hits the bottom line. Absolutely. So we don't believe you will ever have equality in the workplace until you have equality in the home. We want men to be facilitated and supported to take time out to care for their children as much as women are. So if we had a system which encouraged men to take time out of the workplace as much as it encourages women so it was equal, you wouldn't see pregnancy and maternity discrimination because in effect, men would be just as much risk as women are, right. because they'd be taking the time out as well. Right. So the first thing we need to solve is give men ring-fenced, properly paid paternity leave, and we will see paternity leave drastically increase. We've seen that in other countries such as Quebec. We've seen it in Iceland. We've seen it in Norway. We've seen it in Sweden. We know that what men want 
is to take time out to care for their kids. They're just not being supported to do that at the moment. And give us a snapshot at the moment what happens um, when uh, a man takes the uh, poultry two weeks off because that's the recommended... Yeah. Uh, well, that's the guideline. Two weeks. You just had a baby. You're allowed two weeks. You're allowed and you get 100 and what? 149 pounds a week. From the government? From the government. It's the same with maternity leave as well. That's what women get. But if you, as a family, the woman is taking time out to have a baby, so she ha she isn't getting her full income. It's likely that the man's going to earn the most money because of the gender pay gap. As a family, you need that money. So lots of men aren't even taking their two weeks. And two weeks, really, you know, is a it's such a tiny amount of time as it is. With a new baby. With a new baby. In Sweden, for example, they've changed their parental leave system so that men can have 30 days off in the first year mm. whenever they choose. Flexi. They can just flexi, completely flexible and it's fully paid. They can just, you know, say to their boss the next day, I need a couple of weeks off. My wife's really struggling. And what we've seen as a result of that is women's um, mental health has massively improved. It's enormously improved. They're spending less time in hospital. They're less physically and mentally unwell. And the fathers are also happier because mm. they, they're not walking out of the door sobbing their way to work, mm. thinking, I've just left my really unwell wife and baby at home. And sorry to bring it back to the commercials, but um, to use a hard-nosed approach to it, the employer is a lot happier because ultimately that man, uh, that family are more productive and therefore you want them around. Exactly. It's not very difficult, this, is it? You would think it isn't very difficult. The problem tends to happen in the UK, particularly after the economic crash, and I think we're heading for another problem with Brexit, is that when you see problems with your bottom line, your income, employers tend to revert to conventional ways of working where profit is king and they forget everything else. They start to, you know, maternity leave is a problem. That's a burden to business. Men taking time out to look after their children or care for their family. That's not them being productive in an employer's eyes. So they start to discriminate. That's where dis why discrimination is on the rise. They start to expect really long hours for you to be, you know, pulling out all the stops working 12 hours a day. And actually, that makes no business sense whatsoever. If you look after your staff, your staff will look after your company. Your staff are your company. And if you invest in them, you'll get the returns and well-being, improving a member of staff's well-being improves your productivity, improves your bottom line every single time. Welcome back to Renegade Inc. Before we talk more about the motherhood penalty with Jolie Brearley, let's have a look at what you've been tweeting about in this week's Renegade Inc. Index. First up, we've got a tweet from Harini Fernando. The birth of a first child has essentially no effect on a man's earnings trajectory. By contrast, a woman experiences a profound and lasting hit to her pay. The motherhood penalty is easily the largest remaining contributor to gender gaps in labour markets. True. Absolutely. Harini is bang on. Women suffer a massive pay penalty when they have kids. Dads, actually, some research shows get a pay rise and promotion. You know, they definitely don't lose any money and definitely don't get demotions. Again, the gender pay gap, we talk about the gender pay gap and we just rarely talk about motherhood. And that is the cause of the gender pay gap. It's when women have children, that's, that's when it happens. And that's the motherhood penalty. And that's the motherhood penalty. Next from Anna Whitehouse. Things I regret thinking parents were slapped for leaving the office at 4.59 p.m. Taking off my engagement ring in an interview for fear it screamed might get knocked up. Miscarrying at my desk because I didn't want my boss to know I was trying. I mean, wh where are we when you read this sort of stuff? It's devastating and miscarriages are a massive, massive problem. Women don't tend to tell people that they're pregnant before the three month mark and if you have a miscarriage it's likely before the three month mark. And I've spoken to so many women who've had a miscarriage and have told their employers they're having a miscarriage because they're at work when it happens. And then 
they come back and they start being performance managed because their employer knows that they're going to start trying to have a baby and they've, they've got no protection because they're not then pregnant. So they get kicked out of their jobs and you know they're just in a complete mess. It's, it's devastating. Next from Anna Harris, I nipped out of work to bring Hub home from hospital today and caught some of Jeremy Vine debate about egg freezing. Why is debate centered on women's choice to have a career versus not having a career rather than scrutiny on a working environment that doesn't support working mums. Egg freezing is just utter insanity. This is employers trying to literally stop biology so they can get more productivity out of women. <laughs> we just need workplaces that work for humans rather than trying to mess with biology. It's absolutely insane. It's you, like a dystopian future. But you can hear shareholders now screaming, workplaces that work for humans. Yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> Finally, from Apple News, uh, becoming a mother doesn't mean losing your drive, value or brain function. So why do we still put the blame on mum brain and continue to perpetuate the negative stigmas that drive workplace bias and the motherhood penalty. I hear this a lot, you know, this baby brain or mum yeah, brain stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's not rooted in science and no. it's pretty patronising stuff. There it? is absolutely no scientific evidence for baby brain whatsoever. It's used as another way to patronise mums. Oh, are you pregnant? <laughs> it's almost you can see them. someone patting them on yeah. the you're clearly useless now, you've had a baby. And it's just a way of them feeling that, you know, it's okay to be biased towards you. It just perpetuates this bias, this discrimination, this issue that we have with women being pregnant and having children. Paternity leave, or rather what I would prefer to call parenting leave, uh, is very important uh, for families because what we need to do if we're serious about gender equality is to provide the time and resource to support dads on their own to get really good and confident at looking after their own babies. What we really want is for dads to have a, a decent chunk of time paid at a rate where he can afford to take it it could be later in the first year. It, it might be tacked on to paternity leave, or it could be a bit later on. The crucial thing is that he needs to be able to afford to take it. If he doesn't take it, that's lost to the family. So he can't pass it over to her. He needs to, to take it. If you are a baby, what you want in your life is uh, a small number of adults who love you to bits and know how to respond uh, to whatever your problem is. You're going to develop what's called secure attachments with those, uh, with those adults and, and that is very closely linked to better mental health. Um, self-confidence when, when you get older. Fundamentally, you, you, uh, you know deep down that you have a very solid base of people who love you. Every single couple I've seen uh, who has described their experience on shared parental leave has had a good experience. Um, the problem is that the eligibility is very limited. The way the system is set up is quite um, retrograde in the sense that it's actually maternity leave being transferred from the mother to the father. And that embeds this idea that uh, all this stuff is women's domain. We haven't quite persuaded uh, the government to um, make the changes needed, but I think there are more of us calling for that now. One of the things that strikes me uh, as somebody who uh, is an employer and looks at the business world quite closely and is interested in it, and certainly interested in entrepreneurship, and it's this, it's the waste that goes on. Because say uh, you have a couple of employees, three employees, whatever it might be, uh, and they go off, have a baby, uh, they still have those skills. They still understand your culture. They still have the ability to do their jobs perfectly. Mm -hmm. But what happens because of a hiatus, which is natural because they go off and have a, a child, then they are 
still available to come back and do incredible work. And in fact, having had a baby and all the leadership skills that come with that and all the resources that you are exposed to, you actually come back uh, a lot more efficient mm -hmm. uh, and with a bigger set of skills. Yeah. Why aren't we talking about that? Well, it's insane because it's particularly with Brexit, we're hemorrhaging skills from the UK. and We know that nine out of 10 sectors say they can't get the skills that they need. And yet nobody says, well, hold on a minute. There are all these women, particularly women, sat at home who want to work but can't, who are really highly skilled. Right. So we know from Save the Children that there are 840,000 women who want to work but can't purely because of the cost of childcare. We have the second most expensive childcare system in the world. It is prohibitively expensive. There are millions of women, parents, sat at home who want to work and they're not able to. When employers get rid of women at this point because they're pregnant or because they've just had children, they don't think about the long-term cost, mm. what it's going to cost them to replace that person. If you are going to push women out of the workforce in that middle management level, you are going to lose just an unbelievable amount of skill. And as you say, those parents that have taken that time off to look after children, they're not just sat watching Jeremy Kyle in their underpants. They are, it's the most effective training course you could ever go on. Mm. You learn unbelievable amounts of patience. You learn how to multitask like a ninja. You learn about the extremes of emotion. There is loads of research to support the fact that when women return to work, they are much better team players. They are much more productive than they were previously. You know, it really is an unbelievable management mm. training course that you go on. But it's an epic miss is it not, for these employers, because of their rigidity of thinking, because of the stereotypes that we talked about in the first half, they are missing a massive commercial goal here. Absolutely, yeah. So maybe pregnant and screwed should be really talking hard to the business case, to the CEOs, the chairman, whoever, chairwoman, whoever it might be. Maybe we should be making that business case to them and saying, actually, you're missing a trick here. Well, we do. And there are businesses that say they want to employ returners, women and men that are, are at home that are taking time out for caring. The problem comes with the fact that you can have great policies in place as a business, but really what it comes down to is your line manager. And does your line manager really think in a long-term or a short-term mentality? And the reality is... I can answer that. that the, <laughs> no. No. The, the reality is that most employers see flexible working as, well, you're not doing your job properly and you're pretty useless and so let's not bother promoting you and shove you on the side. They see people taking time out to care for children as just a, an expensive burden and a problem and they don't think about you know, the, this long term thinking about well-being, thinking about the skills that retaining skills in their workforce. And uh, is there ever a case to answer when you speak to an employer and an employer says to you, well, we actually have tried and we've actually been taken advantage of a bit here because people have come in and, and you know, been here for a nominal amount of time and then left and therefore we feel a bit burnt by this now? Absolutely. Because it's not all, you know, there, ha there have been people who've exploited and, and been opportunist about yeah. maternity leave. Oh, yeah. And we're not saying it e it's easy. Of course, if somebody is going to leave your business for nine months, that is a challenge. Mm. But running a business is a challenge. People go off sick. People have lives outside of work. You have a constant challenge if you're managing staff. And if you do this properly, the long-term benefits are enormous. So, you know, you just need to work out the best way of doing it. How do we start thinking differently about this? Because as we said, again, in the first half, it is a sort of 1950s mentality. And actually, we're here now. We've agreed that it isn't gender specific. Mm. We've agreed that commercially it makes good sense. Mm -hmm. How do we start thinking differently about the uh, motherhood penalty? The whole structure and system needs to change. The labour market isn't working for anybody. And the labour market, the way it stands at the moment, has been set up at a time when women were at home looking after the children and men were going out to work. But actually it's got even worse because at least back then we were working nine to five. We had boundaries right. and constraints around the way that we work. Right. What we've got to is an even bigger challenge almost with flexible working because those boundaries are blurred and they've gone. So people are working really long hours, they're working into the night and they're not having that respite, they're not having the time with their families that they need. So we're all going a bit mad. So we need to rethink, say, presenteeism is a massive problem. People 
think that if you're sat at your desk for 10 hours a day, that you are a good member of staff. And that's not true. So we need to rethink the number of hours that people are working overall. But we also need to look at all of the systems and structures around it. So childcare needs to be properly subsidised. It needs to be flexible. It needs to be available because at the minute people can't get childcare in certain cities. We need paternity leave so that men have access to three months properly paid paternity leave that is ring fence that is theirs so men start to take time out in their droves and then we just need to look at this whole culture of presenteeism and the fact that we're working ourselves to the bone and it actually has a negative impact on our productivity as a country and on the family and on society and on the family and on society because exactly. we don't talk too much about that but, no. the, but what happens within a family is that all sorts of pressure that children, you know, will feel regardless of their age because of the vibration in that home, mm, yeah. uh, which is unnecessary. We know that kids do much better in education and much higher well-being if they see their dads, if they spend really good quality time with their dads. We know that if dads spend at least 24 hours with their child on their own in the first year of a child's life, that a couple are 40% more likely to stay together. So men need to be released from this relentless long hour working culture so that they can spend more time with their kids. But mums are also going a bit mad because they're being pushed out of the workforce. They're made to stay at home with the child constantly when actually they're full of ambition and skill and they want to be stimulated in other ways besides just looking after their child. So we need a, a way of utilising those skills in the workforce because that's good for mums, it's good for the country, it's good for the economy. So the current structure we have is just bad for everybody. It's not working. I'd vote for it. You should run for Parliament. Oh, thanks. I don't know if you, how much you get done looking at the current political situation, <laughs> um, but thank you very much for coming by. Thank you. That's it from Renegade Inc. this week. You can drop the team a mail, studio at renegadeinc.com, or you can tweet us at Renegade Inc. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. Stay curious.